hello viewers welcome to our youtube channel in today's video we shall touch on the outcomes of most infections in our communities so why are we talking about the outcomes of most infections in the communities or in the hospitals let's ask these questions first have you ever wondered if there was something more serious than just malaria in the hospital have you ever wondered if your loved one had something more serious than the typhoid fever that took him or her to the hospital have you heard of the word sepsis for those of us practicing in the hospital have we heard of the word sepsis and have we actually understood what this is all about? Have we been wondering if there was a difference between sepsis and infection, between sepsis and septic shock? Why are we talking about this today? The first reason why all of us have to join hands to understand sepsis is because it is the first killer condition in our less developed countries this is because most of the infections that we have in our communities we can name from malaria to typhoid fever to cholera Ebola, COVID-19, most of these infections, they end up with sepsis. So most of our patients do not die from pneumonia. They do not die from diarrhea diseases. They do not die from malaria. They do not die from typhoid fever. Most of them, they die from what we call sepsis. Because sepsis, it's a continuous process from infection. Sepsis is like the end point of an infection. When it is not treated, most of the infections will end up with sepsis. And this is why it is important that we start talking about this condition. Because it is a condition that is killing most of our patients. We have to talk about this because sepsis can be prevented, it can easily be identified and it can easily be managed if identified early enough. One of the reasons why we have to understand sepsis is because it deals more the effects that sepsis have in our vulnerable population is damaging. It affects more those people who are vulnerable. And when we say those who are vulnerable, we are referring to our children because their immune systems haven't been developed well. We are referring to our parents because their immune systems are weak. We are referring to our loved ones who are having conditions like diabetes, like hypertension, or even conditions like heart diseases, like lung diseases. All these people, they are more likely to suffer more from sepsis than us who are young, with strong immune systems. It is important that we also understand that once someone has developed sepsis, the likelihood that he or she will still develop sepsis in years to come is increased. It is also important for us to understand that once sepsis has been treated, there are also long-term effects of sepsis. 
Have you had someone who was treated from an infection? Let's say malaria. Maybe we thought the patient had malaria or typhoid fever. We were told they had pneumonia. And after spending at least 10 days in the hospital, not talking, not being able to move, they got well. And while back at home, they started complaining of unexplained pain. Pain that they could not even explain where the pain is coming from. They will get up in the morning and they are like, I didn't sleep well. They often complain of not being able to sleep well. Or sometimes they even complain of hearing voices that are not existing, of seeing people that are not existing. And the common thing that usually happens with us is once people start seeing things that are not existing, hearing voices that are not existing, what do we do? We go to the mixing houses, right? Because we think that's where the solution is. Some of these are just the consequences of sepsis. They are just the consequences of treating someone with sepsis. And once we identify these conditions, we should be able, we should be able to manage them. This is why we have to talk about this. This is why we have to understand that untreated sepsis oh, is a problem as well. It's important that we educate the population to understand that sepsis kills and because sepsis kills we should be able to prevent it. In our respective hospitals do we have systems to be able to identify sepsis? When you take the patient's vital signs and the vital signs are out of normal can we use this vital signs to say that this patient is having not just malaria but that the patient has started developing sepsis or septic shock and do we document at the point of entry that this patient who is not breathing well is not just having a respiratory tract infection but is already having signs and symptoms of sepsis have we been able to educate the patient's relatives or the guardians that their patient is no more having just malaria but sepsis it's also important that we understand that when someone develops sepsis the resources that we have to shift are enormous in order to manage sepsis. The financial resources of managing sepsis, they are enormous. And the consequences to our families, they are overwhelming. Imagine that you have to spend 500 US dollars, or you have to spend maybe 300 and something thousand francs to treat sepsis. Meanwhile, treating malaria, we might not spend up to 10,000, 20,000 francs if our patients, they are admitted in the hospitals. But once they develop sepsis, we have to spend more than 100,000 francs, more than 200,000 francs to manage the condition. So there we was. It is important that all of us we start understanding what this condition is. We start understanding the ravaging consequences of treating sepsis, the long-term effects of treating sepsis, involving everyone in the prevention of sepsis is key.
to reducing morbidity and mortality from sepsis in our respective hospitals. So what happens when an infection is transitioning to sepsis? What happens when you come to the hospital with malaria? Or when a patient presents just with malaria? How do we see that sepsis is setting in? What happens when a patient comes to the hospital with cough? And just maybe in a couple of days, the patient starts not breathing well. Or we discover in the hospital that the heart rate of the patient is increasing or that the respiratory rate of the patient is increasing. This is how an infection transitions to, to sepsis. You can already see how the manifestations, they change from a specific area to two or more areas being affected. This is to tell us that a simple infection that our loved one was suffering from is transitioning to sepsis. Imagine that a patient is in the hospital or our loved one is in the hospital and we are treating him or her for malaria. And then they start telling us that our patient can't talk well. And in the hospital, they have already ruled out cerebral malaria. There are no signs and symptoms to tell us that it's cerebral malaria. But the patient gradually loses consciousness, gradually becomes disorientated, is confused, can't even know that he he or she is in the hospital. This is to tell us that brain is already failing. The brain is becoming dysfunctional. What happens when the color of our of the skin of our patient changes, becomes white, or becomes dark? What happens? When he or she starts urinating with pain, starts urinating less and less urine. This is to tell us that it is not more malaria, it's not more typhoid fever, it's not just meningitis, it's not just pneumonia. There is a switch from a simple infection or an infection to sepsis this is to tell us that instead of that infection the affectation is becoming systemic it's taking the whole body all the other organs are being affected and once these organs are being affected they start having manifestations that these organs are dysfunctional the heart can't pump enough blood to the tissues and the organs. This is to tell us that the heart is becoming dysfunctional. So we can already see how there is a switch from an infection to sepsis. So we need to understand how this happens. And once we understand how this happens, we'll be able to identify swiftly and timely that there is already a switch from an infection to sepsis and that there's already a switch from sepsis to septic shock and that is why in our next video we shall be able to differentiate between an infection and sepsis and septic shock and sepsis because these are all a continuum there's a change from an infection to sepsis and sepsis to septic shock so we all need to be in line with this so that we can prevent our patients dying from this deadly condition